My dearly beloved in Christ, in the world in which we now live, there's much sadness and sorrow. Both words are often used interchangeably, but in reality, they are very different. Even Christ experienced sorrow, but never sadness. Sadness, melancholy, depression, low spirits, dejection are all the same thing. They may be unavoidable at times, but they are always unprofitable. In the Holy Scripture, there are many references as to the detrimental effect which sadness and negativity have on the heart. Proverbs mentions, A glad heart makes a joyful countenance, but by grief of mind the spirit is cast down. A joyful mind makes age flourishing. A sorrowful spirit dries up the bones. The sadness of the heart is every plague. And as a moth destroys the garment, and as a worm or termite the wood, so sadness destroys the heart of a man. Sadness and negativity can not only take away our desire for either work or recreation, but it's also deadly to our spiritual life. It causes our fervor to decline, our faith to weaken, and our charity to become neglected. In addition, it brings with it an abundance of harmful emotions, including anger, anxiety, resentment, jealousy, revenge, etc. My dear and beloved in Christ, it can make us pray to feelings of melancholy, discouragement, or hopelessness, which weakens our desire and effort to follow God's laws and please Him. It makes us tend to say, it's no use in trying to persevere to the end. Though sadness can have a disastrous effect by numbing and paralyzing our efforts in advancing in the spiritual life of the soul. At times, negative thinking may normally arise, but when it becomes incessant and continual, and if left unchecked, it can lead to depression and even self-destructive behavior, such as self-pity, addictions, cutting, suicide, and false escapes from what we really want most in life. Negative thinking, even at a minimum, can sap our energy, wear away our self-confidence, and leave us in a continual bad or sad mood. Sometimes we may be sad or in a negative mode, and I really want to know why. There may be no obvious reason at all. In the preparatory prayers of the Mass, which are taken from the book of Psalms, we read, Why do I go about in sadness? Why art thou sad, O my soul? And why dost thou trouble me? These words are quickly followed by the cure. Trust in God, for I shall yet praise him, the salvation of my countenance and my God. My dearly beloved in Christ, even the saints felt momentary sadness, and have warned us against it again and again. St. Francis used to say, leave sadness to the devil and his disciples. We, however, should always rejoice in the Lord. The followers of St. Francis became known as the joyous troubadours of God. St. Francis de Sales in his writings advised all to serve the Lord with gladness and said that good living Catholics should always be joyful, even in the midst of their crosses. He added that nothing except sin does such harm as melancholy. It has been said that sadness is the devil's greatest weapon, while joy is his greatest defeat. It's one thing to realize this, but when we're hit with life's disappointments, wrecked hopes, failures, Thoughts of all that might have been, along with the discouragement caused by our own sins, weaknesses, and shortcomings, we begin to feel helpless and become easy prey to negativity, sadness, and even depression. This is when we especially need the grace of God so that we can persevere and hold on to our faith and stay close to God and our Blessed Mother. We must leave the past and the future 
to God, the past to his mercy, the future to his divine providence, and live in the present moment. Concentrate on the now. It's not the things from without which are our greatest dangers, but the things that lie within our hearts which can help or destroy our relationship to God. God said, I will not leave thee, neither will I forsake thee. He will never walk away from us. It's we who walk away from him. Cheerfulness is thus necessary for the life of the soul, especially in our dealings with others. We need to clear our minds of any selfish notice of how others treat us by their petty ways or drama or lack of consideration. We must also keep in mind that we should refrain from inflicting our negativity or sour mood on others. It's hardly charitable to impose the gloom we carry with us upon others. If we do, we find that others will tend to veer from us as they do not want to be pulled into such a negative atmosphere. Our response to what things happen to us and how others treat us is dependent upon our attitude and free will in dealing with them. A perfect example of this can be seen in the following true anecdote regarding the Greek philosopher Socrates. Once when his nagging wife emptied a pail of water over the head of Socrates, all the patient philosopher said to his startled associates was, I might have known that such a heavy rain would have fallen on such a violent thunderstorm of words. <laughs> if we are to be relatively happy on this earth, as God wants us to be happy, we must redirect our negative thoughts into more positive ones. You must choose to be cheerful rather than negative. And most importantly, we must pray and rely upon God to help us conquer sadness and melancholy and negativity. A powerful aid in this regard is frequent confession. As God's grace is a means of our happiness, inasmuch as no one can be really happy unless united with God, it follows that frequent confession and was, is one of the chief means of becoming and remaining happy. As together with Holy Communion, it, more than anything else, leads us and binds us to Almighty God. Father Charles Colton says that frequent confession is one of the joys of the soul. For it permits the soul to humble itself, to relieve it of its fears, to purify itself and unite it more closely to God. Spiritual writers tell us that the habit of mortal sin and frequent confession cannot exist in the soul at the same time. We either give up either the one or the other. Even though frequent confession is a necessary part of our happiness, it's so, so strange that many neglect it and are lukewarm regarding it. Some people don't even make their annual confession. Satan, because he knows how useful and necessary frequent confession is, does all in his power to keep us from doing so. Caesarius relates that a certain priest who had led a blameless life, being on his deathbed, saw Satan in the corner of a room. At first, he was alarmed. Remembering how carefully he had endeavored to serve God all his lifetime, he took courage to ask the evil one in the name of St. Martin, What are you doing here, you cruel beast? He then, by virtue of his priestly power, commanded the evil spirit to declare what it was that chiefly kept souls 
from falling into his hands. Satan remained silent. The priest ordered him in the name of God to answer him and to speak the truth. The evil one then made this reply. There is nothing in the church that does us so much harm and keeps so many souls out of our power as frequent confession and holy communion. Some may use the excuse that there's so many other things which demand their time and attention that they really can't go that often. I would ask them to search their mind as to see whether they're really following the ways of the world around them or following God. And to finally ask themselves if they're truly happy within their hearts at this very moment. I'll conclude with this last story of an officer in the king's army. A cavalry officer entered a Catholic church where a mission was being given. The preacher was speaking of confession. And at the conclusion, the officer decided to go and make his. He did it with sincere repentance and came away feeling as though an intolerable burden had been removed from his heart. In the presence of several persons who were still waiting in the confessional line, he exclaimed, Hear me, I beg you. I assure you that I've never tasted in my whole life a pleasure so great and sweet as what I now feel since I'm in the grace of God. I do not believe that the king whom I've served for 36 years can be happier than I am now that I've cast off the dreadful burden of my sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen.